Yeah. And, and, and what happened to the forums? So look, if you go back to Plato's Republic, there are some rather cryptic remarks that he makes. This was my question. This was going to be my question because in Plato's Republic, he says, Homer's no good. Homer. No, 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 no. Homer has Achilles in Hades crying. That can't be this. We cannot have this. We need a cosmology where the good people go to heaven and, e- and experience eternal bliss and the bad people go to Hades, not Achilles going to Hades. And so my question is, is Plato setting up the, the cosmology of Judeo-Christianity? Okay. So, so now I was going to go to Republic, but let me just make a, a brief yeah. aside here that's relevant to how you frame this question. In Phaedo, the, the death dialogue, the dialogue where Socrates drink, drinks the hemlock and martyrs himself. Socrates' disciples are all around him, his friends, his friends are surrounding him. And he says that he, he tells them they shouldn't worry because he's going to a place where he's going to be surrounded by all the best men, essentially an afterlife populated by the virtuous. And um, lays out, as you put it yourself, a kind of prototype for the Christian vision of heaven. Uh, And he basically, how is this set up? Um, Let me, let me actually read you the passage. It's because it's it's quite striking. Uh, This uh, friend or uh, disciple of Socrates is Cebes or Cebes says to him, Probably even in us, there is a little boy who has these childish terrors. Try to persuade him not to be afraid of death as though it were a bogey. What you should do, said Socrates, is to say a magic spell over him every day until you have charmed his fears away. But Socrates, said Simeus, where shall we find a magician who understands these spells now that you are leaving us? Okay, that's uh, when they're imploring him to console them about his dying, right? To reassure them that he's going to a better place and that they shouldn't, you know, uh, excessively mourn his death. And so then Socrates comes back with, he comes back with, quote, if I did not expect to enter the company first of other wise and good gods, and secondly, of men now dead who are better than those who are in this world now, it is true that it would be unjust for me not to grieve at death. As it is, you can be assured that I expect to find myself among good men. While I would not particularly insist on this, I assure you that I could commit myself upon this point if I could upon anything. One more time. While I would not particularly insist on this, I assure you that I could commit myself upon this point if I could upon anything, unquote. All right. This is a disaster, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, in the same dialogue, Phaedo, this is, these quotes were from Phaedo. In the same dialogue, Socrates says, Plato, of course, in the mouth of Socrates says, that we can't have any true knowledge while we're inside the body. That we can only have approximate knowledge and that true knowledge can only be attained through total freedom from the senses. Objective absolute knowledge can only be attained when our mind has been freed from our body and it's distorted perception of things and we're able to perceive sort of like as if from the vantage point of the realm of forms, okay? But he's presenting a vision of the afterlife where that's not the case. When he wants to reassure his disciples, he's presenting like what becomes the classic sensuous afterlife of, let's say, Christianity. By faith, right? right. Having faith. And, and that's in that state, you have what's called a soma pneumaticon. That's what the Greeks called it, the spectral body. Soma pneumaticon. 
it is a world where you still have perception and you still have sensations even. Now, here's a further problem. This heavenly afterlife that he presents us with in Phaedo contradicts what he writes in Republic in the myth of error, in the myth of the, the story of this soldier error, myth, of, myth is not the right word, in this tale of error in Republic, we're presented with basically like what we would call today an NDE, a near-death experience account, where this guy Air sort of dies and lives to tell the tale, comes back and lives to tell the tale of what the afterlife is like. What is the transition between death and rebirth like? Because, of course, Plato argues in favor of reincarnation. Right? And the, or the Orphics use this as the secret, um, the secret knowledge of what to do when you go to Hades and how to reincarnate the right way and, and keep your memory. Yes, like they Plato, just... Plato studied all these things, right? So, but the thing is this, the story of error portrays a kind of afterlife transition between death and rebirth that's actually very similar to what we see in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Absolutely. Mahayana Buddhist account of the Bardo state. And it is not the same as what Plato says to reassure his disciples in the Phaedo. They right. conflict with each other. Absolutely. And the account of the Phaedo conflicts with what Plato says about knowledge only being possible once we free our mind entirely from the senses, because the Bardo state or the state of the Soma Pneumaticon is still a sensuous state. And so this stuff doesn't make sense, okay? No. And the guy is obviously not a moron. He's not contradicting himself. He's saying these apparently contradictory things for a reason. Let me present one more. Uh, yeah, no, and everything you're saying is, this is what I've been wondering about Plato since I've been reading about him. Like, where, what is going on with Plato? And is it, it seems that he's changing. He wants to change the norms of what people think about reality in the, in the afterlife. But go ahead. So one more point that's relevant to this death scene, to, to you know, the, the account that we get in Phaedo of Socrates' last days. His disciples show up and they see him writing poems based on Aesop's fables. These animal stories, the animal stories with a moral about donkeys and things. Yeah. And he's sitting there in his last days writing poems based on Aesop's fables. And they ask him basically like, what are you smoking? Like, what's, have you, have you lost your mind, Socrates? Like, what are you doing, man? This is how you're spending your last days? And this is what Socrates says in reply. He says, quote, now let's keep in mind right now, this is the, the Plato who's writing this is the guy who in Republic has claimed that the poets should be banned right. because they're corrupting the morals of the youth. And he thinks there should be very narrow like limits on like what kind of poetic compositions there are for the sake of edification and inculcation of virtue in the youth. This is the guy who's writing what I'm about to read. He goes, Socrates says to his disciples who are wondering if he's lost his marbles, versifying Aesop, quote, I did not compose the poetry to rival either Evanus or his poetry. I did it in the attempt to discover the meaning of certain dreams and to clear my conscience in case this was the art which I had been told to practice. It's like this, you see. In the course of my life, I've often had the same dream, appearing in different forms at different times, but always saying the same thing. Socrates, practice and cultivate musike, the arts, in the sense of poetry, musike. Socrates, make music. In, in the past, I used to think that it was impelling and exhorting me to do what I was actually doing. I mean that the dream, like a spectator encouraging a runner in a race, was urging me on to do what I was doing already. That is practicing the arts, because philosophy is the greatest of the arts, and I was practicing it. But when my trial had taken place and this God's festival was delaying my execution, I decided that in case it should be this popular form of art that the dream intended me to practice, I ought to compose and not disobey I reflected that a poet ought to work on stories, not discourses. And I was no story writer. 
So it was the stories that I knew and had handy, which I versified. Aesop's, the first ones that occurred to me. So, okay. This is a diabolical writer. Yeah. This is a, what is he telling us here? He's telling us something about the relationship between the Dionysian essence of the poetic and the kind of art that Plato sought to produce in his youth as a tragedian on the one hand and the Apollonian rationalism of what becomes Plato's philosophical project on the other hand, as exemplified by the theory of forms. And the same Socrates who's telling us this ridiculous and unbelievable thing, namely that, oops, maybe I was supposed to like versify children's stories and animal fables instead of doing philosophy. Maybe that's what this voice, this daemon was telling me all my life that I should make music, right? Uh, and I did, the, I, I wasted my whole life. So I'll make up for it by making poems of, you know, animal fables that I read in childhood. No, no, no. So this ridiculous story is really another way that Plato is signaling the fact that there's an esoteric and unwritten doctrine here. That when Socrates says in the symposium, the only thing I've ever understood and that I've devoted myself to worship in life is Eros. Again, Dionysian power, right? Um, and so now where I was going to go before, and I think this is a good time to loop back uh, around to it, is these passages in Republic where Plato is comparing the forms to the diagrams drawn by geometers. And, and so look, according to the conventional understanding of the theory of forms, you obviously can't see forms, right? right. So you can, no matter how perfect the circle you draw is, it's not a representation of the form of the circle, mm -hmm. nor is a perfect triangle the form of the triangle, right? The geometric diagrams that are drawn on blackboards or whatever, or these days that are formulated by computer code, are not the form of that geometrical object. I mean, if you, if you zoom in enough on what appears to be a perfect triangle generated by a computer, it's gonna pixelate at some point, okay? Even if you were to print out a what appears to be a perfect triangle using individual atoms, right? In molecular nanotechnology, if you use an electron microscope, it's gonna also pixelate. So nothing we can craft in this world will represent the perfect circle or the perfect triangle or the perfect square or whatever, right? Isn't that Forms... debunk Plato? Well, no, but here's the thing, right? Plato claims that the forms exist in this invisible realm, right? That okay, they're gotcha. beyond the physical world. But here's the thing, is that I don't think he really believes that. No, me neither. There are passages in Republic where he compares the invisible forms to the diagrams drawn by geometers. Okay, try to grasp this point. This is a little bit of a subtle point. So the diagrams drawn by geometers can never represent forms. They're infinite, they're eternal, they exist in this realm beyond the physical world. So Plato shouldn't be comparing forms, the real forms, the transcendental forms, to the diagrams drawn by geometers, but he does do this. He does do this in Republic. I'll give you the passage in a minute. But let me lay it out. And what he says is that these forms are meant like the diagrams used by geometers to act as step ladders in order to help us intellectually grasp or spiritually grasp with our mind's eye the form of the good. So all the other forms are simply step ladders or uh, useful tools like geometers diagrams to help us grasp the form of the good. The way that geometers use the drawing of a circle on a board to help someone understand what a circle is as an abstract definition. And 
with equal significance, Plato says, I was afraid that if I, and he said, okay, so that was Republic, what I just uh, you know, laid out there, and I'll give you the passage numbers in a minute. And then in Phaedo, he says that I was afraid that if I contemplated the form of the good directly, I would go blind the way someone who looks into the sun does. And so I took refuge in the realm of ideas, or and so I took recourse to ideas, meaning the forms. Right. So what are these forms then? Are they constructs that are meant to help you not go blind intellectually and spiritually? And what's the relationship between that looking straight into the sun and the madness that Plato talks about in Phaedrus? Divine and that, madness. And that Alcibiades accuses Socrates of having him driven, having driven him to in Symposium, the divine madness. Okay. So let me just let me just uh, take a moment to give some references here. Um, the geometer's diagrams that I was talking about, that's in Republic 510 to 511 C, 510 C to 511 C, where he's saying that. All the other forms are there only so that you can contemplate the form of the good. And they're like tools. They're like geometers, diagrams. And then the passage where he says that he was afraid he'd go blind by staring straight into the sun if he contemplated the form of the good directly, that's in uh, Phaedo 99D to 100A. Phaedo 99D to 100A. Specifically, he says, quote, I thought that in the contemplation of true existence, I ought to be careful that I did not lose the eye of my soul, as people may injure their bodily eye by observing and gazing on the sun during an eclipse, unless they take the precaution of only looking at the image reflected in the water or in some analogous medium. I was afraid that my soul might be blinded altogether if I looked at things with my eyes, and I thought that I had better have recourse to the world of idea and seek there the truth of things. Okay, the world of idea, meaning the realm of forms. Mm 